かけるおままに観光バスが止まり This video is going to be a very brief introduction to the infamous Japanese pink films, more specifically, the first wave from 1962 to 1971. Hopefully, it provides people new to the genre with a little bit of extra context to help them with their journeys into it. However, if this video is a tad basic for your requirements and you want to dig deeper into the topic, I provided links to some great resources in the description below. This is probably the most requested video I've received, so I'm going to try my best to make it as comprehensive as possible, but without going into too much detail. There's way better content out there if that's what you're looking for. Okay, so pink films, or pinkuega, or even eroductions, which is a portmanteau of erotic productions, used before the phrase pink film stuck. According to scholars, a pink film is any Japanese softcore erotic picture. That is produced and distributed by small companies. This means famous erotic films by large studios like Nikatsu, Toei, or Shokiku are discounted. Additionally, pink films were shot on either 16mm or 30mm film within a very limited time schedule. Around a week seems to be what most people agree on. Each film averaged an hour in length and required a specific quota of sex scenes. But despite this common criteria, The films differed in their ambitions and scope. Jasper Sharp said, Titillation may be the primary purpose, but aspects such as character, story, and technical qualities are also given their due consideration. As with most creative and rebellious revolutions, Japan's pink films were partly the products of filmmakers working around limitations. A primary case of this was censorship. Those familiar with Japanese cinema are probably aware of the country's heavy censorship. Regarding the depiction of genitals and pubic hair, sometimes resulting in that awkward digital pixelation being used to cover them up. Well, according to Donald Ritchie, this restriction forced certain filmmakers to develop creative and sometimes elaborate methods of avoiding exposing their actors' genitals. This was achieved by the directors positioning props in strategic locations to block the banned body parts. It's actually been argued that this censorship limitation facilitated the unique style and interesting compositions in Japanese erotic cinema. With Western pornography, for instance, because everything is shown, its value is simplistic and is kept on what Ritchie called its elemental level. Because pink films were restricted with what they could show, it generally forced the filmmakers to adopt more artistic measures. Thus, allowing the audience to engage with something more than just imagery of genitals, and as Pierre Harrits called it, the complexity in the representation of gender and the human mind. Another limitation that fueled this artistic development was the lower budget independent companies that produced the pink films. The restricted finances and resources also gave the filmmakers no choice but to work around them creatively. There were several eras that painted their own unique pictures of pink cinema. But before we can address those, it's important to consider that after World War II, Japanese cinema was gradually allowing eroticism to manifest within it. In the 1940s to early 1950s, nudity in Japanese films was still taboo. However, by the mid 1950s, the exposure of flesh and direct sexual candidness was beginning to creep into its cinema culture. Shintoho's female pearl diver films, and the teenage Sun Tribe films, particularly. Though it would be foreign films that properly introduced Japan to female nudity, despite it not being until the early 1960s that such trends would properly manifest within the local cinema. Before this, Japanese films that depicted graphic sex could only be seen via single reel stag films. As mentioned previously, the first wave of pink films would reign from 1962 to 1971, beginning with Santoru Kobayashi's Flesh Market. An independent film made for just 8 million yen, yet managed to make 100 million in return, proving that there was now a genuine market in Japan for pink films to develop within. Things began to take a drastic turn in 1964 when director Tetsuji Takechi made a big budget film that was distributed by the large studio Shokiku called Daydream. The year after his film Black Snow caused him to be arrested on charges of obscenity and a high profile trial to pursue. After Takechi won the trial, 
the publicity surrounding it launched erotic films into the spotlight, which helped provoke a production boom and made Pink Film's production trendy. Japanese actor and Pink Film legend Naomi Tani refers to this period as the age of competition. Despite Japan's major studios occasionally making erotic films in the 1960s, Suzuki's Gate of Flesh being an important example, as it was the first Japanese mainstream film with nudity, nonetheless, the bulk load of the erotic films were made independently and cheaply. As Pink Films had a substantial audience, these small companies made dozens of cheap films with profitable outcomes. The most influential studios to produce these films tended to show them on a three film program in their own chain of speciality theatres. Another pink studio that can't go unmentioned is Wakamatsu Studios, which was named after the director who formed it, Koji Wakamatsu. After quitting working for Nikatsu, Wakamatsu established his studio in 1965 and will become arguably the most important director associated with the pink film genre. So much so, he's often regarded as the pink godfather. His films would transcend beyond titillation and earn critical admiration by orchestrating themes of sex, violence, misogyny and sadism, he managed to incorporate intricate political statements into his films. The Pinku Planet seemed to align in 1965 because this was also the year directors Kan Mokai and Giichi Nishihara established their important independent companies too. I can't forget to mention directors Agawa and Yamanoto either. Along with Kan Mokai, they were so important during this era of pink films, they earned the title the heroes of the first wave. Noriko Tatsumi was also a key actor during this wave of pink and is regarded as the first queen of Japanese sex movies. But other actors made significant contributions during this era too. Marina Gisa, Naomi Tani and Kazuko Shirakawa started making their names in the first wave of pink films before later gaining more mainstream success with Nikatsu in the 1970s. Throughout the 1960s, independent production companies pretty much dominated the pink film market, but as the 1970s came along, Japan's struggling major studios, who were losing their audience to television and US imports, began to see the consistent and assured pink film patronage as an avenue for their own recovery. Specifically Toei and Nakatsu, who in 1971 entered the sexploitation market and paved way for two new strands of Japanese erotic cinema. These were known as Toei Pinky Violence and Nikatsu Roman Porno. My next two videos will be introductions to both of these, starting first with Toei's Pinky Violence films. I know this video was meant to be dedicated to the first wave of pink films, but I think it's important to quickly emphasise their relevance even to this day. The films were always made to be theatrically released, and unlike pornographic films from around the world, where their theatrical relevance died out in the 1980s, Pink films are still thriving in cinemas today. According to Jasper Sharp, hundreds of these films are still produced every year by independent production companies and are completely self-sufficient, making up a significant proportion of Japan's independent cinema output. Sharp writes, The pink genre is a vital, self-sustaining and thriving part of the Japanese film industry, yet it is one which is virtually ignored by critics both inside and outside of Japan.